since then. He's gotten hooked. Okay, well, I'm totally obsessed with the stars. Do you want to open up your counseling handbook? Oh, no, we can't, but I have to, I have to write something inside with the... stars in the sky just by looking up what's your um, what's your favorite planet um mars how come because red it, it's colored red and red's my favorite color what's your favorite star um polaris and sirius are my favorite stars <laughs> maybe sirius is polaris's neighbor i think they might be neighbors yeah Yes. Like a lot of kids, my son has this incredible curiosity about something I hadn't really thought about in years. The night sky. Oh, look at the moon. Oh, look up right the moon. It's even close to us. Yeah, very close. Huh? Welcome to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And On the show today, we're going to hear from Babylonians who never lost that pagan idolatry. So sometime in the future, and we're talking the far future, at some point there won't be anything to see beyond our galaxy. Distant space will appear pitch black, empty. And to understand why, physicist Brian Greene in his TED Talk explained that you've got to go back to the year 1929. When the great astronomer Edwin Hubble realized that the distant galaxies we're all rushing away from us, establishing that space itself is stretching, it's expanding. Now, this was revolutionary. The prevailing wisdom was that on the largest of scales, the universe was static. But even so, there was one thing that everyone was certain of. The expansion must be slowing down. Why? Well, gravity is an attractive force, right? You drop anything, it falls to the earth. You throw anything out a window, it falls down. Where gravity pulls things together. So similarly, gravity out there in the cosmos should be pulling each galaxy toward every other. So if they're rushing apart, they should rush apart slower and slower over time. It's sort of like, you know, if you throw a baseball up in the air, it goes up, but it goes up slower and slower. So gravity of the exact same sort should be slowing the exodus of the galaxies. So, so in 1929, this Babylonian... So in 1929, the Babylonian Hubble came along and told people that the universe is no longer our galaxy, it is growing. Yes, it was totally revolutionary. And in fact, there was a, another fellow named Georges Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest, who told Einstein that he was studying the math of Einstein's equations in general relativity, and the math seems to say that the universe should be expanding. Einstein said to him, your math is correct, but your physics is abominable. He was saying that you can't always trust the equations. In fact, Einstein went back and tried to change the equations so that they wouldn't imply that the universe was expanding. Then Hubble, with these observations, proved that it is, and Einstein turned sharply around and described this picture of the expanding universe as one of the most beautiful things he'd ever encountered. That became fundamental confusion in astrophysics, that the universe is expanding and slowing down. Now, everyone accepted that theory for 70 years until there was a problem. There was definitely a moment when we realized that something uh, very weird was going on, something very surprising, um, but our initial response to this was, oh, this must be a mistake. And apparently at the same time, uh, all the way across the other side of the country, some scientist was coming out with the same conclusion. So try to listen well, in. Does, does this sound good right now, or does it sound definitely? It's all problem. And I'm a professor of physics at Berkeley, and a senior scientist at Berkeley National Laboratory. It happened while well, they said they were uh, observing distant supernovas taking somebody's money and 
wasting somebody's time. So they, after they analyzed the data, both teams found that the expansion is not slowing down over time. It's speeding up over time. If this were true, they could get even richer off the expense of others. Wasting time chasing vanity. Oh, absolutely. This is bread and butter material that you learn. Now you learn it as an undergraduate. I learned it as a graduate student. But to say the expansion of the universe was speeding up is crazy, insane. That's what the scientists were saying. So they needed some more time and some more money. Yes. It was a crazy idea. Um, you had to report what it looked like the universe was doing. Right, so you're looking at results, but your assumption is that probably something must be wrong. Maybe there's some, you know, sneaky effect that we're both getting tripped up by. You just figure, well, obviously once we finish doing all the calibration, once checking all of the uh, different parts of the, of the program, the data you know, will end up looking more like what we expected. didn't think the first time we saw it, wow, the universe is accelerating and we're going to win a prize. We were aware that we were going to have to be absolutely sure that we were right because it was such a major issue. Anything we said about this, we'd, we'd have to go back up and show that we had checked every possible way in which it could be wrong that we could match. To yep. say the universe is expanding at an ever-increasing rate um, was, you know, from the scientist's viewpoint, crazy. So they needed some more money. And I remember it was Ashkenazi Einstein that told them this couldn't be like this. You can't always trust, trust the, the equations. equations. Literally, it's as if someone said to you, throw an apple up in the air and it's going to go up faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And, faster and it was faster just faster a faster sense faster of this faster can't faster be faster, 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 faster and faster and faster and faster. You'd say it. Crazy. Totally crazy. So, what does that mean for us? And Einstein's hailed this the smartest guy ever. But remember, there were two teams, both coming to the same result, independently of the other. So it's very convincing when different lines of investigation are all pointing to the same result. And within a few years, other Babylonians began to verify those results. Listen in, as one of the Babylonian talking heads explains on the TED stage. It doesn't make sense because what I think of is how amazing it is that we little tiny puny creatures who are just crawling around the surface of this little planet around a nondescript star in the outskirts of an ordinary galaxy, that we've been able to figure this stuff out. That to me, how should I say, gives me a sense of connection to the universe, a kind of sense of partnership with the cosmos, if you will, that I find thrilling. You see, we learned that our universe is not static, that space is expanding, that that expansion is speeding up all by carefully examining faint pinpoints of starlight coming to us from distant galaxies. But because the expansion is speeding up, in the very far future, those galaxies will rush away so far and so fast that we won't be able to see them, not because of technological limitations, but because of the laws of physics. Unlike those galaxies have been even traveling at the fastest speed, the speed of light will not be able to overcome the ever-widening gulf between us. So astronomers in the far future, looking out into deep space, will see nothing but an endless stretch of static, inky, black stillness. And they will conclude that the universe is static and unchanging and populated by a single central oasis of matter that they have had a picture of the cosmos that we definitively know to be wrong. Now maybe those future astronomers will have records handed down from an earlier era, like hours attesting to an expanding cosmos teeming with galaxies, but would those future astronomers believe such ancient knowledge? Or would they believe in the black, static, empty universe that their own state-of-the-art observations reveal? I suspect the latter. Does that ever make you sad? No, because a few hundred million here, a few hundred million there, and um, you've got people in the middle of the ocean trying to make it. And listen in as the Babylonians tell us of this new uh, version of you. It's the effect I think we've all experienced when you have two mirrors that are facing one another. You put any object in between and it gets reflected back and forth, back and forth between the mirrors. And I would sort of think to myself what it would be like to have a parallel reality out there where there's a version of me but one that had a mind and an ability to do things different from the one that I experienced. You're going to be watching them through your virtual headset. Why, there may be other copies of you, other copies of me, other copies of everything you know. Our show today, The Wonders Above Us. Next up, The Asteroid Hunter and his quest to save the Earth. It's the TED Radio Hour.
Apophis is an asteroid that was discovered in 2004, and it's going to pass by the Earth in April of 2029, and it's going to pass us so close that if it's just right, the Earth's gravity will bend it just enough that seven years later, Apophis is going to hit us. Now listen, as the Babylonians attempt to discredit Wormwood and the other stars, prophesize to fall upon the Earth in these times. You've probably heard about the asteroid Apophis. If you haven't yet, you will. Um, Apophis is an asteroid that was discovered in 2004. It's roughly 250 yards across, so it's pretty big. Big size, you know, bigger than a football stadium. And it's going to pass by the Earth in April of 2029, and it's going to pass us so close that it's actually going to come underneath our weather satellites. The Earth's gravity is going to bend the orbit of this thing so much that if it's just right, the Earth's gravity will bend it just enough that seven years later, on April 13th, which is a Friday, I'll note, in the year 2036, you can't plan that kind of stuff, Apophis is going to hit us. It will hit us. Now, that was the thinking uh, a few years ago. Now, the thing is, the orbit of this object in 2029 is not precisely known. We do know very well that it's not going to hit us, but by exactly how much, we don't know. And if it gets a little bit closer than we expect, by, by literally, you know, a mile or less, um, the Earth's gravity will bend the orbit a lot, and then seven years later, it'll miss us. And if it's, if it's too far away by, I don't know, a mile, it's probably even less than that. Seven years later, again, it will miss us. But if it's right down the pipe, if it hits this bullseye in space, which is what we call a keyhole, it passes through that area, then the Earth's gravity is exactly enough to bend the orbit such that seven years later, this thing will come back and hit us. So imagine you're outside that day and you're looking up. Given that it's moving at... 20 miles per second and that's a guess it could be moving faster or slower and the atmosphere is very roughly 100 miles high and it's coming in at an angle uh there might be five or six seven eight seconds something like that where you'd see this thing coming in if you happen to catch it early on so you have several seconds to go what? now listen as the babylonian man attempts to try to tell us that he knows what it's like and then there would be a tremendous flash of light you might see the explosion. It would look very much like a nuclear bomb. You'd see a mushroom cloud, uh, and then a shock wave would come rumbling through the ground. A few seconds later, followed by the compression of air. The shock wave through the air. And um, after that, uh, you know, debris raining down, uh, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of craziness. And it gets worse the bigger these things are. At 250 meters across, Apophis is nowhere near as big as the six-mile-wide asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs, but it would still obliterate everything within a couple hundred miles, and if it lands near a major city, that would be bad. It would be bad for you, and glorious to I and I, the city of Babylon, shaken. Now, the odds of that happening are one in a million, roughly. Very, very low odds. So I personally am not lying awake at night worrying about this at all. I don't think Apophis is a problem. In fact, Apophis is a blessing in disguise because it woke us up to the dangers of these things. This thing was discovered just a few years ago and could hit us a few years from now. It won't, but it gives us a chance to study these kinds of asteroids. We didn't really necessarily understand these keyholes, and now we do. And it turns out that's really important. Because how do you stop an asteroid like this? What Phil Blake points out is that... We can't move the Earth, but we can take a lot of money. And we can fool people into thinking that they have to be afraid when they should be worshipping I and I Creator, who will give unto them a new heaven and a new Earth. This question, what force is driving all galaxies to, to track and monitor and record everyone's behavior and have inserted the chip in most every person. Um, they'll need to up their satellite communications and this is very costly and requires a deal of maintenance and therefore it will be necessary to establish communes, planetary communes. That's right, and that's the, 
the big, huge mystery to us. We've measured the amount of dark energy, assuming that's the right explanation. And it's a decimal point followed by roughly 122 zeros and then a one. Which is such a strange number. It's the kind of number that we don't typically encounter when we do physics or mathematics. This number is small. Expressed in the relevant units, it is spectacularly small. And if you are their enemy, you are a risk to their livelihood. The resources are getting slim. They are attempting to control the populations from taking um, what they need to survive from these consuming, wicked individuals. Listen in as the lie is fed on the dead stage. The mystery is to explain this peculiar number. We want this number to emerge from the laws of physics, but so far no one has found a way to do that. Now, you might wonder, should you care? Maybe explaining this number is just a technical detail of interest to experts, but of no relevance to anybody else. Well, it surely is a technical detail, but some details really matter. So, as if there was some deep, sacred law in the universe that could explain that number, like, like the dark energy number? That's right, and he looked for explanations, but never found any, and now we know that he was, in fact, asking the wrong question, because... It's called... Bullshit. The Babylonians invented arithmetic and they have been obs obsessed with numbers ever since. These are dumb dogs with blind guides. They worship gods they know not. 